Hi, in my previous video I did a teardown of the new Rigol DS1052Z and there it is, it's still in bits and an amazingly low uh, cost oscilloscope for four channels, 399 bucks, it's absolutely incredible. So I was curious to know how they've actually uh, re-engineered the, fr uh, the input uh, analog front end channels on these to uh, lower the price point and get four channels for the price of two and as we saw in the previous teardown which if, if you haven't seen I'll link it in down below check it out first uh, I noted that they had gone for a di an entirely discreet uh, transistor based front end pretty much so hey I figured how are they doing it and also how are they doing the bandwidth limiting on this thing because the model uh, whether it's 50 megahertz 70 megahertz or 100 megahertz it's just a software configurable thing so how are they changing that and limiting the bandwidth inside the scope there's only one way to find out reverse engineer it let's go and the first thing you're going to want to do is take a photo of both sides of the board. So I've got my camera set up on the tripod here and I'm actually using a uh, high f-stop here so that I get a really deep depth of field so that high components aren't out of focus and I'm making sure I'm focusing directly on like the smallest uh, surface mount component on the board. So um, I'm going to keep that so hence uh, using that high uh, f-stop value is going to give me a long shutter speed in this case it's like half a second or something so I can't hand hold this thing I've got it set up on the tripod and I'm going to get set the frame just right and I'm going to try and keep the same frame for both uh, shots when I flip the board over just so that I can get pretty close to the correct scale factor inside the camera you don't have to do that you might alt you can and might ultimately have to um, scale uh, the images in uh, software later but anyway it's nice if you can just get it first go and also just make sure you've got decent lighting. The reason I've got it at a big angle like this is because if I had it flat like that, straight up like that, I would get uh, shadow in from the cans up here due to my overhead light. So you really want some uh, decent light. You know, if you've got one of those uh, light tents or something like that, then you can get really good shots. And what you also want to do is get a torch, um, and maybe not a point source like this, but uh, I'm going to use one of my uh, light boxes or something like that and put it behind so that you can see the traces through the board and hopefully you can actually see if there's any inner traces happening in there. So anyway, if you've got a nice even light source, you can light up the whole thing at once and uh, that can help on multi-layer boards. But hey, if you've got like an internal ground plane, I mean, this one is uh, reasonably flood filled, then yeah, there's not a lot you can do about that. And then once you've got your images loaded in, then you can do various uh, processing techniques on them to, uh, in this case, I've converted to black and white here, which uh, sometimes helps. And then I've uh, converted, added a filter to find all the edges like this, and then you can further reduce the color. So when you go to print these sorts of things on overhead transparencies, for example, you're pretty much uh, left with just the uh, traces and the uh, pads and components uh, and uh, outlines of the components and that's what you want to do when you it's handier to do that when you're using the overhead transparencies comparing the top and bottom layers okay what I've chosen to do here is the first pass is actually get a negative of this uh, board image here and it, and it looks pretty funky when you've done a negative and I've scaled them to exactly the same size done some micro rotations and things like that I think I'm getting fairly close so I'll print out one as a reference and then uh, because you'll need one as a reference and then you print out the other one and then you can just micro scale that if you have to so I think I'll print this one out on my black and white printer and uh, see how that that works out and then what you do is print each layer out onto overhead transparency like this so that you can see through it and you line them up and if you've scaled correctly ta-da they will overlay like that and all the uh, vias you basically use the vias as uh, alignment markers on there and uh, too easy you can now 
see and follow signals through top and bottom of the board and then you can either put a uh, white page on the bottom or insert it if you just want to do one side and you just go on like that so that makes it real easy to play with and the good thing about transparencies like this is that you can now come along with some whiteboard markers like this or highlighters and you can highlight uh, all the traces one by one as you do them in different colors so you could have all your ground all in green and all your you know your positive rail in red and all that sort of stuff so you can you know really make sure you don't miss anything and I'll try and show you some of that layer alignment up close if you have a look at those three holes over there they're nice ones to sort of line up and you can see that there's holes on the top side of that and they just line up perfectly and then over this side we can get get some there and we can just line those up brilliantly in one corner and the next but often as I said you'll uh, print out like the first one and then do some micro adjustments on the second one um, it often pays just to print it out on paper first don't waste your overhead uh, transparencies because often you're not going to uh, get it quite right on the first pass depends on um, how you're good at uh, how good you are at uh, doing this sort of stuff in your um, uh, edit programs. I'm not that crash hot, but I managed to eyeball it, no problems. So now comes the fun part of uh, tracing out your circuit. And you're pretty much only going to need a basic multimeter just to uh, measure and confirm some resistances and uh, maybe try and measure some capacitors in circuit, although that's usually uh, not easy to do. But uh, ideally what you want you know, for measuring in circuit resistances, so unless you want to desolder the parts or lift one end of the part, not easy on SMD parts for example as opposed to the old-fashioned uh, through hole type where you could lift one uh, leg on the end of it pretty easily then what you want ideally is a multimeter with a low voltage ohms function and neither of these multimeters here for example have it but I'll show you how to check to see if it's got uh, a low voltage uh, functionality on the resistance range and the reason this is important is because you're measuring in circuit if the output voltage of your meter here is too high then you risk turning on uh, PN junctions in your circuit and that can upset your reading so you want as low an output voltage as possible and some old old meters particularly back in the uh, day I'm talking the 80s something like that 1980s it was very popular to have a button on there for low voltage ohms function but it seems pretty rare these days now we can actually check this Bryman meter here for example BM257 nice little uh, sort of hundred dollar class multimeter by the way if you're looking for one it's a really quite a nice meter Anyway, what we can do is measure, so use a second meter to measure the output voltage here on our uh, ohms range and then change the range to see what output voltage we're getting. And look, on the uh, 20 meg uh, range here, or at, I think it goes up to 60,000 counts or whatever, uh, we're only outputting 0.26 volts. So that's not enough to turn on a, pi a typical silicon PM uh, junction. So we can uh, change our change our range here and there we go half a volt that's getting towards something that would start uh, turning on a PN junction but still eh, it's not bad um, so and you just go through and check all the ranges to see basically if it's under half a volt you're probably doing okay it should ordinarily be around you know if it, getting like 0.3 volts or under then it's pretty good so the maximum we're getting out of that is five uh, half a volt so that's not a bad meter for tracing out that circuit but if we went the other direction and tried to use this uh, Agilent U1272A, once again an excellent meter, look we're still only getting out half a volt, but if we change our ranges, okay that's not bad, it's not bad, but whoa, look down at the ohms range we're getting 3.2 volts, holy crap, that's enough to, even on the kilo ohms range, look 3.2 volts. There you go. So that's not the best for using uh, for taking in circuit resistance measurements. It's going to switch on PN junctions. Anyway, if you really want to make sure and you are measuring in circuit, uh, measure one way like that, get a reading on your ohms range, and then swap the leads over and read it again just to see that the value is repeatable. And if that value is repeatable in both directions, then you know you can be pretty certain that your meter is not turning on any in circuit uh, diode junctions. But not 100% guaranteed, but eh, it's a good quick test. Anyway, that's just a little uh, in circuit measuring tip.
So we're ready to trace this circuit down and this is the painstaking part and pretty much resign yourself to the fact that you're going to miss something. But anyway, <laughs> we can at least get a good first pass on this thing. So we've got ourselves uh, the pinouts and, and get printouts of the data sheets and all that sort of stuff. So I've written down some pinouts of uh, the most uh, common parts on here that I uh, didn't know or uh, didn't want to goof up uh, from memory. And then uh, we've got our uh, transparencies ready to go like this. We've got our multicolored uh, highlighter uh, pens, our uh, whiteboard markers, and we've got ourselves a pencil. Pencil's important, and remember, always have a rubber on your pencil. And the next thing we're going to want to do is search for these pesky SMD transistor codes, and they can be a real pain in the butt. So I just type in SMD transistor codes into Google, and well, look, the first four hits here, I've got various, uh, the SMD code book, which allows you to, like, the first character of the code, and the bases, all that sort of stuff. I've got a search one, for example, so I can bring in my picture on my board. Look here, we've got uh, 7AT on a whole bunch of of these transistors here so we can type in 7AT and see what we get SMD search boom it's an MMBT 3904 your standard 3904 uh, NPN transistor no problems whatsoever and then they've got entire uh, catalogs like this all the way around here and then we've got a there's one on the DigiKey website a micro commercial components corp uh, SMD marking and unfortunately the issue is is that um, there's not a huge amount of standardization on these codes so even uh, with the same manufacturer they can actually use the same code for different uh, parts and it's just it gets a bit messy so it's not an exact science this but uh, yeah it's it's not too hard to at least get a first ballpark of the codes and here's an example of where you can get confused over exactly what a part might be. In this case, we've got two parts on the back side of the board that are labelled 1B. They're a SOT23, and it can either be a standard 2222 NPN transistor, as you're familiar with here, bipolar, or it could be this one here, which is and IRLM uh, L2803, and this is an N-channel MOSFET. So it could either be a bipolar uh, device, a regular, you know, just a regular switching transistor, 2222, or it could be this uh, power MOSFET here. Hmm. And of course, the only way to actually find that out is to just uh, draw up your circuit and then look and analyze your circuit and go, well, does it make sense for it be, to be a bipolar transistor here, or does it make sense for it to have a little power MOSFET in this particular position? So yeah, you, we just don't know at this stage, so you just draw it in as a generic symbol, make a note, and then you know fill in the blanks later. And of course, the way you'd start something like this oscilloscope, uh, because it's got basically a single input down here on the uh, BNC, and it's going to have an output over here. And that's uh, pretty much it. And circuits are always drawn from inputs on the left-hand side, uh, outputs on the right-hand side. That's just the uh, common convention. So you would start with your input here. Uh, there's our input center pin for the BNC going through a resistor here, going into our relay there. We've got our pin out for our relay. And then we just start drawing it step by step and then highlighting both the uh, top and bottom sheets here as we go in multiple colors if you need to. And then every now and then you'll get to a point in the circuit here where you, uh, like I couldn't see where that one uh, went to so I originally had a question mark there because it, it went down into a middle layer and I couldn't see it. It wasn't on any of my uh, transparent overlays but once I drew the rest of it here I uh, many, I realized well uh, these two bases must be coupled here. So sure enough I measured the two and they are shorted out. So that one ends up being straight across there like that. Beauty. And likewise here I've got another point, the resistor on the uh, base of these two coupled transistors. I don't know where that goes, it went down to the bot it went down to the middle rail, it wasn't on my uh, transparency layers. So once again I buzzed it out, I knew it's a pretty sure bet it's going to be the negative rail down in there, and sure enough it is. And just remember that if you're using this transparency technique, these transistors here on the bottom end all are uh, active devices will be a mirror image of what they are on the top. So if we've got the top here and we've got ourselves, well, let's have a look at the uh, photo overlay. It's a bit clearer here. If we've got a uh, this pin here as the base, emitter and collector of this transistor, the same transistor 
on the bottom here, because this is actually a mirror image uh, photo, this one is not the base. This one's the base, this one's the emitter, and this one's the collector. So it just it's often hard to actually remember that when you're doing this. You can often, you know, just have a little brain fart and forget that and goof up the schematic. So it's different if you prefer the physical technique of having the board like this and then just flipping it over and uh, trying to trace things directly like that. Because then when you flip it over, you have the correct orientation as per your uh, the pinout in your data sheet. You don't have to mentally flip things. And Murphy will of course ensure that you end up with a via that uh, drops through to the inner layer which you can't see on your top and bottom plots here like this. So you get out your continuity tester. This is where a fast continuity tester comes in and you put it on the point you want for example and then you can drag it along uh, IC pins and every other point in the circuit. And yes it is a systematic uh, approach pretty much. I mean if you've already reverse engineered half the circuit you might be able to sort of guess where it goes next depending on its uh, uh, function in the circuit, the uh, the via and net that you have but you know basically it's it's a systematic search for where that thing goes and yes it is tedious and this sort of stuff does take time so yeah multi-layer boards can be a real pain. And yes, it can be even more annoying when your net is on this side of the board and you think it goes to the other side. Or you've checked everything on one side, so you've got to go like this. And get the tongue at the right angle, apply just the right amount of pressure so that you pierce any oxide coating on the solder joint. That's another trap. And then uh, 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 get on the other side and start probing. <sighs> This is taking forever. And then the next thing you've got to watch out for is traces under chips which you can't see, like this uh, the TLV274 quad op amp here. Now, I originally didn't uh, trace this one. I was too busy. I got to uh, the input to the op amp and I was too busy tracing the uh, FET amplifier around here and just got carried away and extended that out. Anyway, I've come back to here and I started tracing it out and the um, inverting terminal down here, pin 2, drops down to a via down in here and let's have a look at that and you can see that it uh, okay it drops down to the bottom side so we, we go down to the bottom side here and it goes through a capacitor like that so I drew it um, you know so I drew it as I saw it but of course that doesn't make any sense you've got to have some sort of uh, negative feedback happening here so you look at the top side again and you go well is, is it going to an internal uh, layer and then going out? Well, it could be. I've already found traces on the internal layers, but check this out. Check out these resistors here. These look like uh, classic feedback resistors uh, for the op amp. And you'll notice that there's a trace going off underneath there. So, aha, uh -huh. does that one go off under there, under the chip to that the back side of that pin which you can't see? Well, you get your multimeter out and you buzz it, and it turns out, yep, it does. <laughs> I was right on the money. So, yeah, you just got to watch out for those things. Use a bit of intuition when it comes to these sort of things. You know, know that, uh, you know, that can't possibly be right. And, uh, you know, that you have to find those resistors somewhere else. And they're always going to be close by. And once again, you end up getting stuck on ones like this. I mean, here's our input uh, switching relay. Here's our main input AC coupling cap. And we've got a resistor here, which is uh, 4.7 meg. And it's going off to a via there, which just goes nowhere like it. Well, of course it goes somewhere. It goes into an inner layer, but we can't see traces anywhere else on the thing is it going off this way that way uh, you know who knows what it's going to this is where we you know we had no clue until we've done a good lot of the circuit now we can have a look at the circuit and see where it can logically lead to and here's the circuit that we've got so far please excuse the crudity of the model i didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it now uh, we've got our input over here of course then we've got an input attenuator here which is then uh in which you can uh, bypass with these two relays here uh or relay contacts it's actually the same uh, physical relay on the board it's the big large one you can see there down there we go um and uh, what have we got, here's our AC coupling cap in here. So we've got a path going down here. I'll explain this later, but uh, 
we've got our AC coupling cap here, and we've got some uh, clamping diodes, and here's this mystery 4.7 meg resistor. It's just going off to La La Land. I, I didn't bother uh, tracing it back then, but where does it go now that we've got the rest of the circuit? Well, I couldn't find the output of this op amp here either. It didn't make sense. It didn't go anywhere. So, you know, what the hell's going on? So it's got to be going somewhere, the output of the op amp, and I couldn't trace that one either. And I figured, well, look, this part of the circuit here, because we've got AC coming through here and DC coupling through this path, selectable here uh, via a solid state relay here, well, this must be the DC path. And then over here, I figured out that we had some um, an E squared pot over here, the ADS, uh, the AD5207. Uh, and that's just buffering that, and that's feeding in. So this must be the offset control for the channel, the DC offset, to shift the waveform up and down, the vertical uh, uh, vertical position control on the front panel. So the output of that has to be going back into here and offsetting the signal before it gets into our FET um, amplifier over here. So by deduction, this point here must connect to this point over here and sure enough I buzzed it out after all this time and bingo that's where it went so if we have a look back at our overlay there's our 4.7 meg resistor and here's pin one of our chip all the way over here the output of the op amp there so this drops down here like this and it must go under well you know it probably goes under because I couldn't see it through these gaps in here when you shine light through it couldn't see it so it's probably running under there like that around there and uh up to uh up to pin one yep up to pin one over here like that and whew, after all that work we're finally finished well as, as finished as i want to be to figure out how this thing works this front end works and how they're doing the uh, bandwidth selection and yeah this is pretty darn ugly so i've redrawn it a bit nicer here we go let's take a look at this sucker it's drawn in dave cad of course so let's start out here here's our bnc input we've got a 75 ohm resistor and then a selectable attenuator in here so you can bypass it there's a common relay there just bypasses the whole lot there's a little trimmer cap in there and uh well, a, a bit of compensation across the uh, input resistor here to um, smooth out the response and, well, <laughs> nothing fancy at all. And then uh, it's AC coupled and goes into our FET input amplifier. And this is a very standard arrangement here. We've got a, um, a JFET on the input here and a low impedance emitter follower output and that goes off to the diff amp which I've got on a separate sheet here. And we've just got some bias resistors here. It goes down to the negative rail and uh, also you'll see that uh, the input here was clamped by a BAV99 diode. It might look a bit weird because I've got the ground up the top here. It's actually negative uh, reference. So we've got a uh, Zena diode here clamping it at some uh, voltage below the uh, rail so you don't want the input any input uh, transients to go straight onto the uh, rail you want them to be clamped to your uh, Zena diode and then you've got a 2k protection off to the rest of your rail and that's pretty easy so uh, that's a um, you'll find this configuration pretty much standard in tons of oscilloscopes way back to the old uh, analog scope days very very common and uh, this part here is rather interesting because um, or this amp is always AC coupled, so it's only amplifying the high frequency stuff. It can't amplify the DC stuff directly from the input here. To do that, it's uh, tapped off right at the output to the switch here, and this is our um, AC uh, DC coupling selection here. Uh, like sometimes it's done like old analog scopes is done right in the uh, input here. They will have like a big AC coupling cap in here somewhere and which you can short out but this is done differently because we need to bias the position of our waveform um, inside our front end amp here for our vertical position control. So all this section here basically um, passes the DC stuff and does offset as well. Um, so if you're measuring DC on your uh, scope for example and you've got uh, DC selected and it's uh, bypassing 
uh, this AC coupling cap here, then the, the signal is not going through here, of course, because that's AC coupled. It's got to go through here and then up to here. And then that allows us to add in another DC signal here uh, for our vertical position control. And they're doing that using a um, analog devices uh, AD5207 E squared pot. You'll notice the question mark here. I didn't trace, well, I couldn't trace where that pin went and no it didn't go down to ground it's gone somewhere else and I would just went ah oh, whatever it doesn't affect the <laughs> the uh, functionality of the circuit anyway and I will likewise here with the question mark if you see question marks anywhere it means I uh, couldn't readily uh, trace them and I just gave up I can put some more hours into it and try and find it but anyway um, and then we've got a couple of uh, muxes here oh I didn't label those uh, 74HC uh, 4053 uh, we use a couple of these in the uh, Rigol front end and um, look they're put in an 8k2 you can select an 8k2 resistor in series with that E squared pot and um, yeah so they're just getting various uh, settings for that and you can put in another 2k resistor as well and then they've got some sort of amp here I couldn't figure out where it went to anyway doesn't matter uh, that adds in a DC signal into here and allows us to shift and position that waveform up and down before it gets into the ADC here. Now one interesting thing to note, this op amp, which is a TLV274 by the way, it's only like a, a like a low bandwidth uh, precision uh, low power op amp, so it's not the full bandwidth. If you're wondering why it's, you know, it, they can get away with like a, a 3 megahertz bandwidth op amp here is because all the AC stuff is going directly into the FET here. So this is only affecting the DC shift offset. So you don't need a high bandwidth op amp here. Although in the DS2000 one, as we'll take a look at the schematic, they did actually use an 8 megahertz uh, bandwidth op amp here instead of this uh, 3 megahertz one here. But anyway, you'll notice, if you are keen, that this is open loop. Um, well, it's not, okay, because it wouldn't work as an amplifier, so it's got to be closed loop. But I couldn't find where uh, this resistor, uh, well, I found that this resistor went to the vertical position control here, but there's no feedback from here. I mean, it's obvious that this op amp here has to be in this feedback loop here. So it has to tap off here somewhere, but darned if I could find it. I'm going to have, probably have to have another shot at it. And if we have a look at the old DS1052E, I think we'll find it's much simpler than this one, and you'll see that it does actually feedback. And here's the schematic for the DS1052E, the older one, not the 1052Z, this new one. It was drawn by A. Helene, so thank you very much, A. So here we go, here they are side by side. We've got our input attenuator here. So it's basically uh, exactly the same thing happening with the bypass relay there. I've just drawn it a bit expanded. Um, he's done it like this, so a little bit different. And look, as I said, a different op amp here. They've got the AD8510. Uh, I've drawn mine sort of slightly separated. Uh, that's just how I uh, decided to do it. I wasn't referencing uh, this one at all, so everyone draws things uh, slightly differently. Um, and this uses an AD8510, and it is like an 8 megahertz uh, bandwidth one, but it's basically the same thing. Here's the AC uh, coupling cap we had down here, which is being bypassed by the, uh, uh, well, in this case, it's a solid state relay. Not sure what it is inside the uh, 1052E. There's the part number if you want to go look it up. And uh, yeah, we've got the offset amp here. Uh, the same 4 meg 7 resistor going into the JFET here. Um, the same clamping arrangement, except they clamp it to the rails where they got a Xena here, but basically exactly the same thing. And then what else have we got? Here we go, our... Uh, Amp, our FET amp is almost identical, almost identical. They've got another, they've got a resistor in here, whereas these, the emitter is tied to the collector here, but uh, it doesn't matter. And they've got an output uh, series resistor here. They didn't have it in this one, or I couldn't find it. So it's a slightly more uh, compact configuration here. And by the way, they've got some, uh, you know, fairly decent filter in here. They've got a two stage filter for this supply, and then they've got a diode between these two. So I'm not sure if this is powering something else. I didn't actually. Uh, follow it off so it, it could be anyway they've got some mark uh, clamping between the rails there and this open loop uh, configuration of this DC offset amp here that I was uh, talking about and how it should ultimately be referenced back to here well look if you have a look on the 1052e schematic bingo here it is look the uh, inverting terminal of the DC offset amp there 
goes through an 806k resistor directly to the output here as I thought it must be. And uh, very curiously, look, they've got that same value 806k resistor here. And I just uh, had a look at that to verify and no, it's not actually connected over to here like that. Of course, you wouldn't, uh, you know, have your output of your uh, op amp uh, on there. So, you know, but they've got exactly the same value resistor, exactly the same connected to the inverting uh, terminal over here. But uh, this one goes off to the vertical position control, whereas the 1052E just has the uh, channel one position just uh, uh, adding into there at the lower uh, part of that uh, resistor divider there. So yeah, it's, you know, they've substantially changed things. But anyway, there's got to ultimately be some feedback from here coming back uh, and uh, and getting through it, whether or not it comes up through here, through the E-square pot and everything else. It could be doing that. I mean, uh, that one there, I checked that one's not connected to there. So I don't know what, you know, I don't know exactly what's uh, going on there. But anyway, yeah, it's got to come back. Otherwise, that thing would be open loop and it wouldn't work at all. Or it'd work as an excellent comparator. So anyway, all of that is essentially exactly the same as what we've got here, except the big difference we're going to see next. Look, this uh, amp, here we go, this on mine, it goes off to the next page, which we'll take a look at next. But on this one, it goes into a, well, a rather expensive, uh, if you're trying to save cost, an AD837 um, programmable gain amp here. And uh, then we've got a differential driver. Once again, that's another uh, analog. Um, no, it's a national uh, part, LMH6552. And these things cost money, right? Uh, they, you know, even if you're, uh, they're not manufacturing, you know, 100 million of these scopes. So they're not going to get them rock bottom price. They're manufacturing, you know, tens of thousands of these scopes. So the price of these chips actually matters. So they've done away with these two chips, as we'll see, and replaced it with a complete discrete transistor solution in this design. And if you remember from our teardown video, that was the big uh, surprise and takeaway from the teardown was that it used an all discrete transistor solution instead of these chips which we had before. So that's how they've really uh, re-engineered and lowered the price of this 1054Z and probably the reason why they can afford to put four channels in here whereas before they could only afford to put in two. So this is what I really wanted to see, how they've implemented this discrete transistor solution and how they're implementing the bandwidth filtering between the models. Um, so let's take a look at it. We've basically got a very, it looks a bit complicated, but if you ignore that, okay, that doesn't exist there, okay, then you've got a pretty standard uh, diff uh, arrangement here. Here's our input from our amplifier on the uh, from the JFET and uh, low impedance emitter follower on the previous side here, and it's a pretty standard uh, differential uh, configuration. I couldn't figure out another question mark. Couldn't figure out where that uh, came from. So we've got our differential output here, and this comes around, and it goes straight into the ADC, of course, straight through. But then they've got these switchable uh, filters hanging off here. They're switching in different value capacitors from each uh, one of the differential lines down to the negative rail. And they've got four transistors, which uh, I didn't know where they go off to, but they you know, presumably go off to like uh, the micro uh, controller, the uh, digital control, so that they can switch these capacitors in and out. And they're a matched uh, pair, uh, of course. So if you're going to switch on uh, this one, you would switch on this one as well. And that would have an 820 uh, puff cap uh, from each differential line down to the negative rail. And likewise, you can switch in the 560 here. And of course, uh, when you've got two different values like this, you can actually have four different configurations. You can have none on at all, uh, so they're not having any effect on the line and it just passes straight through. So that would be full bandwidth. Or you could turn on the 560 uh, puff caps here and that would uh, decrease your bandwidth again by a small amount and then you could switch in your 8 and then disable that one and switch in your 820 puff here and that would have yet another bandwidth and then if you really wanted to you could switch on all four transistors and have them in parallel and that would give you uh, your greatest bandwidth reduction. So there's four different selectable bandwidths there and they're doing that on the differential line. Very interesting.
So it looks like they've put a bit of thought into this and the DS1052Z of course is only a recent model. So, But it looks like that they've planned it uh, way back when they originally designed this thing because they've put in four different bandwidth uh, configurations here. So presumably uh, you turn them all off and that's 100 megahertz or maybe they've got the 560 puff on for the 100 megahertz or whatever and then they turn the 820 uh, puffs on to give you the 70 megahertz bandwidth model and then they might turn both on uh, or four on there to give you the 50 megahertz DS1052Z so I think that's how they're doing the bandwidth selection and of course that's all going to be under uh, software control as well so when they program the thing they program the model number at the factory and it gives it your software control bandwidth but what's going on under this lens cap here? Well, let's take a look at that, shall we? Basically, they're duplicating the exact configuration again. So imagine that's now gone, right? That's now gone, and we're and we're looking at exactly the same thing because the uh, input comes in here and drives both bases there, but they have selectable control over here. Once again, the base of these uh, uh, transistors, these bias transistors down the bottom, have the, um, uh, go into a, a HC4053, so they can sw select one or the other. And what's the difference between the two? Uh, well, the only thing I could find is, look, this has a 200 ohm series resistor. This has a 680 ohm. They both have 1K2s in there, so they are different. So what's happening here is I believe that is the bandwidth selection for the 20 megahertz uh, bandwidth filtering. They're doing that in the differential amplifier itself. Oh, and by the way, I haven't drawn it in, but uh, just as an aside, uh, from the differential uh, output here, they were actually tapping off two of those. Was going into a, a TL072. That's what the TL072 is for. They've got some uh, PMP uh, BC856s here, and I couldn't figure out the feedback uh, configuration there. But anyway, they're just obviously um, some sort of uh, drivers. Nothing to do with the uh, bandwidth uh, configuration. Anyway, I haven't gone that far. This is what I really needed to uh, know. This was the money shot. Whew. So there you go. Uh, a little attempt here at reverse engineering the new Rigol DS1052Z and I found some interesting stuff in there and that's what I was after. This wasn't a complete reverse engineering effort to do absolutely the whole board. I really just wanted to find out what was going on in that discrete amplifier uh, front end there. And there might be errors in this. I haven't taken it, haven't simulated it, any of that sort of stuff. That'd be the next step to make sure. Uh, haven't even sanity checked it, haven't double checked it, done whatever. So if you do see any obvious errors in here, uh, please let me know and I can correct them. But yeah, we found some interesting stuff how they're doing the bandwidth limiting in there. So I hope you enjoyed that. A uh, little look at just one technique for reverse engineering a uh, board like this. There, are, everyone's got their own way of doing it, and depends on the board. Uh, you know, you might do it uh, differently, but this was actually a bit of a pain in the ass. Being a multi-layer board, quite a few traces going off uh, where I couldn't uh, see them. And obviously, if you had, if you're lucky enough to have like an X-ray machine or something, that'd be really handy to um, do stuff like that. But Anyway, so this did, if you think that this is like an hour or two's work, uh, think again. A lot of hours, I put a lot of hours into actually uh, just getting this far. It was lots of, uh, you know, red herrings and uh, little, uh, you know, uh, dead end uh, traps and stuff like that. And just really kind of annoying and tedious work to do. But hey, if you want to reverse engineer something like this, this is what you have to do. And if you really wanted to be 100% sure, you'd have to go through and check it or get someone else to check it. And then you've got to simulate it to make sure it all uh, works and you've got the correct uh, you know, configuration. You haven't left anything out. And I guarantee there's an error or two in there, but eh, I found out what I wanted to find out. And that's the main thing. So as always, um, I'll link in all, all the data sheets and everything for this, these uh, chips. I'll scan in these little uh, DavePad drawings and you can have a look at those. And uh, please, if you see any errors, let me know. If you've got any comments, please leave them down below or on the EEV blog forum. And don't forget, if you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up because that helps a lot. It really does with all the YouTube search stuff and things like that. It keeps me up the top. So thanks. Catch you next time.